Hey everyone, this is Shannon. I'm here for Bible study. Um, I just got done running, so I'm very sweaty. Um, I, I have to be honest, I have not read my notes. <laughs> I have done them, but I, have, I usually reread and go through them and write things down and stuff, and I just have not had time. So in doing this, just a little bit of housekeeping before I start. I probably am going to do next week. Um, I was able to do the lesson this week because my daughter's in PBS. And I opted out of volunteering so I could work and do this, um, and which I'm okay with. I've done VBS for years. So, um, but I also next week my daughter will be doing something, and so after that July, I'm just going to take the July off of Bible study, um, just because summer. You know, I I want to spend time with my daughter, and um, you know, I'm trying to cut out things that I can um, to be able to spend time with her. So, all that to say, once school starts back up, I will finish up John, and hopefully, we'll get through it and everything. So, um, but um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there first to begin with, and then let's go ahead and jump into um, scripture. Um, okay, Lord, we just thank you so much for this time for this word. Lord, this chapter is amazing, and. Um, you are amazing. And Lord, we just ask that you um, guide my words. Let them be yours and not mine. And Lord, we just thank you so much for sending your son um, to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, something that we're not, we are not worthy of, but we are so grateful of. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, y'all, as you're hopping on, let me know who's on. And I need some interaction. So I will constantly say that. Um, okay, so chapter four, John chapter four, um, is this chapter is just amazing. Um, I know the Bible, the whole Bible is amazing. But this one, I mean, everything is amazing, really. But I love it because it shows how, and we've talked about this in Ruth especially, when we went through Ruth, how God accepts everyone. And um, it does not matter where you come from. It does not matter if you come from a Christian home. It doesn't matter if you come from a different religion home and you converted to Christianity. It does not matter where you come from. What matters is where you are right now and accepting the Lord as your Savior. So. Um, I think that this shows that so much, and I can see myself so much in this chapter. And so um, I need interaction. So as y'all are hopping on, please let me know where you're from. Let me know. Um, let me just let me know something about you. Okay, so let's go to verse one through three. This is John chapter four. Um, when Jesus knew that a Pharisee heard, he let me make sure I'm doing. When Jesus knew that the Pharisee heard, he was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Through Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went again to Galilee. Jesus was preaching when the Lord knew he left Judea. Jesus knew that because of his rising prominence and popularity, there would be soon be a confrontation with the religious establishment among whom were the Pharisees. Yet Jesus knew that the time was not yet right for a confrontation in Jerusalem, so he returned to Galilee. Okay, y'all, I just, since I just got back from, um, Israel, this is so cool to read it. <laughs> um, oh, Angela, you're on from Canada. Oh, that is amazing. Um, okay, so what's so cool is I kind of pulled up a map because I am not usually a map person because y'all, I am so directionally challenged. I am serious whenever I say I am directionally challenged. My 10-year-old knows directions way more than I do. So that just kind of tells you where, where I'm at. Um, but since I, um, since I went to Israel and I've gone to these places, it's just really cool to be able to look a little bit on the map and see what it is. So I'm going to pop in this link of the map right here so we can kind of see where Jesus was. So he went from, so if you pull that up, and he went from Judea, which is, Let's see, I looked at all this last night. I felt like a dork because I like never look at maps. And so I felt really smart for a moment. And my husband, I don't know if he was impressed or just confused because he knows I can't read maps. Um, so if you go to the middle here, it's so if you see, um, if you're on that map, you see like Bethlehem, just go right under that. That's a Judea. So that's all Judea. You know, they're sep the, all of those are separated. So that's what's so cool. So he went from Judea all the way up to the Sea of Galilee or up to Galilee. So that's quite, um, it looks like it's far, but it's, you know, Israel is just not that big. So um, it was a hike though. Um, he definitely went on a hike. So that's just really cool. So that is gonna be very important, y'all. That map is gonna be really important as we go through. So just keep this in mind, keep it in mind. Um, 
Okay, so Jesus made and baptized. Okay, I read, did I read that? Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize by his disciples. Jesus' work of baptism was first referred to in John 3, 22. So we talked about that last time, um, a few weeks ago. Jesus considered it important to also do John's work of baptizing as a demonstration of repentance and cleansing in preparation for the Messiah. Here we learn that in the actual baptizing work, Jesus delegated that work to his disciples. And there's, I read a few things on this. There's reasons why he did that. Um, and, you know, Jesus was just so humble. Like, you have to see his humility in this. Like, he was humble. And that's why he did that. Um, this also means that when the disciples began the practice of Christian baptism on Pentecost, and that goes back to Acts, if you go to Acts 2.41, their prior experience of baptizing was in connection with repentance, cleansing, and identification with the Messiah's work. So when we see Acts, we see that it, this started here in John 4. That's where the disciples started um, baptizing. And so that's just, this is just cool as Christians. This is our heritage. So I always like to see the heritage of things um, because, y'all, the, the Old Testament is our heritage as well. New Testament is definitely our heritage as New Testament believers. Um, so this is just really cool um, to just know that this is where, if you see Acts, I love Acts. I love Romans is my favorite book, but Acts is very much up there. Um, let's see, by baptizing, he attested the unity of his work with that of the forerunner. By not himself baptizing, he made the superiority of his position above that of John the Baptist to be felt. So he's just saying, hey, I'm above John the Baptist. Because remember, if you remember if we talk about, we talked about it in John 3, where they were kind of going back and forth with is John the Messiah, you know, because John was like pretty, he was pretty awesome, y'all. <laughs> he was pretty fabulous, but he was not Jesus. He was not perfect. Um, he was the forerunner though. And, and Jesus is respecting John. Remember that respect he had definitely in John three. Um, so he had come from Galilee and from Nazareth. He went back home and back to Galilee where he would minister for well over a year, far from Jerusalem, far from um, and so he went all, so y'all, if you, I'm going to show you a picture of the Sea of Galilee and you will see why he wanted to go back. It is absolutely amazing. Um, the Sea of Galilee is beautiful. So I can see why Jesus wanted to go back <laughs> to the Sea of Galilee because it just is beautiful. So as I'm looking that up, um, so Jesus, when he, if we go back to that map, you notice how he has to go through Samaria. Okay, I'm going to show you the Gal Sea of Galilee. Oh, let's see here. I'll show you. I have a whole bunch of pictures. Okay, look at how beautiful it is. So there, I don't know if you can see, but that's the Sea of Galilee. It is absolutely breathtaking. And so I don't know if you can see it well. I don't know if you can see it. Do you see the mountain? It is it is breathtaking, y'all. It is just breathtaking. So that's the Sea of Galilee. Um, so he went back there because I don't blame him because, man, it's amazing. Um, and so he had to go through Samaria. Although the road through Samaria was the shortest route from Jerusalem to Galilee, if we go back to that map, you can see that. Um, but Jew, Jewish people often avoided it. Um, hey, Heidi, yay, you got me on live. I'm so excited. And Patty, you're here from South Texas. Wow, that's awesome. Um, okay, so if we see that, um, so he had, if we go back to that map, you see how he came from Galilee. He could have went in three different sections. But he chose to go through there. And so what's so crazy is G Jewish people avoided the Samaritans. They did so because they were a deep, they had a deep distrust and dislike between many of the Jewish people and the Samaritans. So this is just cultural. This is cultural. So we all have that cultural thing. We shouldn't, but here they definitely have it. And, you know, you have to remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. I think we will go over that. I can't remember if that's in John or not. But we'll talk about that really much in the Good Samaritan. Um, but when, so this history, you have to go back to the history of this. So y'all, this is going to be, I'm a Bible dork and I love this kind of stuff. So when the Babylonians conquered the Southern kingdom of Judah, so you have to remember you have the 12 tribes of Judah. And, um, so, okay. If y'all do not know this, this is all old Testament. So in the grand scheme of life, this is not, this, this is important for our salvation, but it is not about our salvation, if that makes sense. Um, but this is just cool Bible stuff that you can like tell people and you can feel really smart because that's how I feel sometimes because I love this kind of stuff. Um, 
But see, all they left behind were the lowest classes of society. So in, in the Babylonian, so what happened is, is the southern kingdom came over Judah. They took over almost all the population captive, expelling them to Babylon Empire. All they left behind were the lowest classes of society because they didn't want these lowly regarded people in Babylonia. These ones left behind intermarried with other non-Jewish peoples who slowly came into the region and the Samaritans emerged as an ethnic and religious group. Um, because the Samaritans had a historical connection to the people of Israel, their faith was a combination of commands and rituals from the law of Moses, put together with various superstitions. So they, what did they do? They added to God's word. And remember, we talked about that in John 1. We can't add to God's word. God's word is perfect, but they did. They added to God's word. Most of the Jews in Jesus' time despised the Samaritans, disliking them even more with the Gentiles because they were religiously speaking half-breeds who had an um, like mo like a mongrel faith, like a bad, like a not the faith that they had. So the Samaritans built their own temple to Yahweh on Mount Gerizim, but the Jewish or the Jews burned it around 128 BC. This obviously made relations between the Jewish and the Samaritans even worse. So this is history and history of um, just bitterness towards each other. So their route from Jerusalem to Galilee lay through the region beyond the Jordan. This was considerably longer, but it avoided contact with the Samaritans. Those who were not so strict went through Samaria. So this was a cultural thing. And y'all, the Jordan, y'all will be surprised, but the Jordan is not, not big. At least it's not now. I don't know what it was like when Jesus was there, but it is not big. It is like, I mean, y'all, I'm serious. The parts of the Jordan that we saw, it was literally like that wide. It was just long. It's very long, but it's not. It's, it's not like what I pictured the Jordan to look like. I pictured the Jordan to be amazing. And it, it is amazing. I mean, I'm not going to lie, but it's not it's not that wide. Um, so this is just saying that there was other ways that Jesus could have went, but he chose to go this route. That is important, y'all. Um, so he goes to Galilee, or so it says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. The need wasn't because of travel arrangements or practical necessities, but because there were people there who needed to hear him. Okay, Jesus went out of his way for us to hear him. That is important. He does that in our life. Um, hey, Crystal, I'm so glad you joined me. Um, and Shannon, I'm so glad y'all are joining. Um, so as you see, as you see this, this is so important, y'all, because Jesus does that with us. He goes out of his way to show and reveal himself to us. We have that choice to choose it, choose him or not. Um, so, but he does this. He does these things all the time, y'all. I talked about God Wings last week. I mean, he does these things, and it's so cool. So here he's going to Galilee, um, and he's going there for the great Galilean ministry, which you know about if you've been. Um, so if you, so, this is this is really important. So in order to get there, he had to pass through Samaria. Well, technically speaking, you don't have to really pass through Samaria. So let's go back to that map. Um, you can take the coastal route. So let's say we could go the coastal route. And y'all, this is I'm not this much of a map dork. I'm really not. But this is just fascinating to me, probably because I just got back from there. If you see the coastal route, he could have totally went over where the Jordan River, away from Samaria. He could have went on the other side, which would have been way out of the way. But they did go way out of the way to not see the Samaritans because they hated them so much, y'all. This is so, so, so sad that there is that they 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 had that much hate in them. Um, so if you see those two different ways that they could he could have went, um, but he chose not to. But see, if you were an Orthodox Jew, you and you went through Samaria, you worried about defilement. So defilement means you are dirty. If you went through that, um, you were supposedly dirty because you were just near them. That is so sad, y'all. Is that not sad? Does that sadden y'all that people had that much hate towards just people they didn't even know just because they were a certain way? I mean, I just, I hate that. I hate that, um, that they, they didn't even know the people, you know? And so if you, that, and it's just, and it kept, went all the way back to even before they were even around that he did. Um, and so um, that's just kind of like the backstory of the, the way, um, the way he could have went, but he chose, Jesus chose to go that route. Um, I know y'all, I can't either. I cannot imagine living like that and being like that and everything. It's just so sad. Um, okay. So verses four through five, he had to travel through Samaria. He came to a town, Samaria, called Sakar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Okay, this is more New Te Old Testament stuff. I'm going to take a drink. Okay, so what's so cool about this is 
this is our history of Joseph. I love Joseph. I love, love, love Joseph. He was a man. I think he was like one of the Old Testament men that really honored the Lord like so well. <laughs> I mean, he. I think he was a little prideful. I mean, remember what he talked about his brother. So he had pride. Remember we talked about Hezekiah. Pride always gets in the way. Um, and so, um, but J so Jacob had the 12 sons, which ended up being the 12 tribes, which we see that all, that is so important in our history. Um, like I said just a minute ago, but here Jacob's well is where the Samaritan woman is going. So she's going all the way from the Old Testament to Jacob. And, um, and it was the capital city of the Samaritans. So this is all Samaritan, y'all. Um, and so let's talk about a little bit about this well. There's a little history to that. So this is where Abram, which Abram is from Genesis. So if you go into Genesis, you can see about Abram who became Abraham. Um, he's very crucial to our walk, our, our Christian faith as well. Um, so this is where Abram first came when he arrived in the Canaan from Babylonia. That's Genesis 12, 6. You can go back and read that. And this is where God first appeared to Abram in Canaan and renewed the promise of giving the land to him and, and his descendants. That's Genesis 12, 7. So remember, his, his descendants is Jacob and um the and Joseph and all of them. This is where Abram built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. That's Genesis 12 8. This is where Jacob came, came safely when he returned with his wives and children um, from his sojourn with Laban. And that's Genesis 13 18. Y'all can go back and reread this uh, or read this. This is where Jacob bought a piece of land from Canaanite named Hamar for a hundred pieces of silver. That's Genesis 33 19. And this is where Jacob built an altar to the Lord and called it. El Aholahi, Israel, Genesis um, 33, 20. And this has established the connection between Jacob and what became known as Jacob's well there in Sikar. So Sikar, which is Shechem, also was the place where, um, this is not a, a great story, so, but it's, it's, it's in the Bible. And this is where Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, was raped and the sons of Jacob massacred the men of the city in retaliation. And that's Genesis 34. That's a really sad story. Um, but I think, I really think whenever you read stories like that, you just see that God understands and knows when bad things happen and, um, he is in the midst of them and he shows that, um, sometimes when people have that happen to them, they're so full of shame, but we, sh there, there shouldn't be shame there and there's healing in God. And so I think that that story, we can't take the good and we can't only take the good of the Bible and say there's only good, there is bad in it because there's human nature. And unfortunately, bad things happen. Um, but that story is just a really sad story. Um, and so this um, was the plot ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Land Jacob had conquered from the Amorites with his sword and bow in the unrecorded battle in Genesis 48, 22. And this is where the bones of Joseph were eventually buried when they were carried up from Egypt in Joshua 24, 32. So this is where Joshua made a covenant with Israel, renewing their commitment to the God of Israel and proclaiming, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24. Great verse. So you see all of the history here. This is a very important plot of land. And I mean, and I'll, I'll be honest, y'all, being in Israel, God does care about land. I mean, he just does. He cares about this land. This land is huge. And, um, and I think that this is just showing you how important this land is. So Jesus is going back here. Jesus knows all of these things that happen in this land. He knows this. So this is really, and I mean, it's just really important. Um, so that's this kind of the backstory of the, the those verse and where we're at, um, what happened and everything. Cause I love that kind of stuff. It's, I mean, I know it's not like crucial that we have to know all these things, but it's just cool things to know. Um, so verse six, Jesus was worn out from his journey. This said, so it shows you in verse six um, that, Jacob, okay, so he was wore out. That just kind of shows you that G Jesus was human. Um, he, that's the humanity part of him. Um, and so this just is, it just, just shows this genuine humanity and it shows that, you know, who he was. And it's probably, I would have to say it is a hot day. Um, Israel's just hot <laughs> and he was tired. Y'all, how many of y'all been in the heat all day, especially walking all day in the heat and you're just exhausted. So this is where Jesus is at. And then verses seven through nine, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. 
Okay, so this is this is this is how cool our God is. So this woman came for water at an unusual hour. Usually they came usually the women went really, really, really early in the in the morning because it was cooler. Um so for her to be there and for her to be alone, this is this is key to know, y'all. Um typically women came are in groups as well, so they would never came alone. So perhaps there was a sudden need or perhaps there was a social outcast shunned by other women in the community. And this, y'all, this saddens me. I y'all I don't know why people do this. And 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 you have to say only we're only human. We are not we are not Jesus. We are not perfect. But there should be no reason why we should ever shun anybody. I mean, we just shouldn't. Um, you know, and so I think that this story is so, so good to know um, because it's showing you that people are only human and we can't expect perfection from people. We can only expect perfection from God. Um, there's going to be people that are just mean and that's just all there is to it. There's going to be people even in the church that um, unfortunately just don't treat people right and everything. And that's just not, that's not biblical. Um and so we're going to keep going because I'm going to get back to this, though. So this was also countercultural because men did not speak to women in public, especially rabbi Jewish men. They did not talk to women at all in this culture. Um, so here Jesus, a rabbi, is talking to a really bad, bad woman. Um, well, she's a well-known adulterer and divorced five times, and we'll learn that coming up. Um, the strict rabbis forbid a rabbi to greet a woman in public. A rabbi might not even speak to his own wife or daughter or sister in public. There were even Pharisees who were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because they shut their eyes when the when they saw a woman on the street and so walked into walls and houses. How hilarious is that, y'all? <laughs> that to me is hilarious. Um, now, there is a good thing about walking in purity. I'm not going to lie. This is awesome because, you know, you want your husbands to do that because, you know, there's just women that dress in modest and stuff. But, I mean, like, that's just hilarious. Um, you know, you got to honor that, though, <laughs> in one sense. Um, so, in all this, um, so, like, so in all of this, we see many of the seeming paradoxes of Jesus's work. He who gives rest is weary, and he who is in Israel's Messiah speaks to a Samaritan woman, and he who is living water asks for a drink from a well. These were just really like odd things for him to do because it's just it's just so countercultural. So um, in verse eight, Jesus and his disciples usually carried. You kind of wonder where are the disciples at right now. So um, they usually carried little or nothing to eat on their journeys. Rather, they they brought money to buy provision along the way. Purchasing food was a common assignment given to the disciples. Jesus did not fare being defiled by food bought in a Samaritan village. Again, that's really awesome that he did that because that was just not a common um, thing as well. Um, so verses 10 through 12, I'm so excited about these verses. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket in a well that well in the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father, Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Can you just sense can you sense her sarcasm? I would I'm so a sarcastic person. So I would totally be sorry, like, yeah, whatever. You know, I just kind of picture that. I don't know how she was. In my mind when I'm reading this, I always envision things in my mind when I'm reading them. And that's how I envision because I kind of put my personality in that. And I would totally be sarcastic. You have to remember, she has been scorned. She has been judged. And in some part, rightfully so. Um, and we'll get to that in just a second. But she was hurting. She was broken. We have to see that. Um, so she probably was very guarded. Can you just see that guard around her? Like, who are you to tell me anything? Um, so Jesus drew the woman in the conversation, making her curious, curious about several things. He made her curious about the things of God. If you knew the gift of God, he made her curious about who Jesus is, who it, who it is, who says to you, he made her curious about what he could give her. He would have given you living water. Doesn't curiosity get us? Any of y'all curious about things? Um, I know for me, through curiosity, I came to truly have a relationship with Jesus. I will be honest with you. My sister was dating this guy, and he said some things, and I don't know if I, I didn't agree with what he said that the Bible said. And so 
out of my curiosity, I went back and started reading the Bible. That's when God started planting the seeds, started putting people in my life to constantly tell me about Jesus, constantly um, tell, like just putting conversations over and over. Um, meanwhile, my brother became a believer. He was going in the mission field through the IMB, and um, he was talking to me about the Lord. So there was just many, many like conversations, and it was through curiosity. So I can get this lady. I get her. I get that curiosity. Um, there are many things, but that was, it was through that. It was through me opening the Bible for like, I hadn't opened it and read it to read it. Like, and just really like reading what scripture said. And so, um, you know, and there, and there's a thing like part of us that kind of get frustrated with our kids when they're curious, right? They always ask questions. Why, 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 how many of y'all that drives nuts? Like just drives you nuts. And you're just like, I don't know why I'm so tired of you asking. Um, and here's the thing. Try not to quench that curiosity. That curiosity is going to bring them, hopefully, to know the Lord. Um, because if your kids have a spirit like that, then, you know, they're going to dig deeper into Scripture, I would hope. I, that's what I always tell my 10-year-old, because she's that way. She's very curious. And I'm always like, don't just assume, because your mom and dad say this, that that is truth. You need to go back and read it for yourself. And she asked a lot of questions on our family devotion that night. Um, about scripture and I love that and I want her to continue to do it even though some nights I'm just really tired um, and I just really want to go to bed but she I'm I have to remind myself to be thankful for that so if don't quench the spirit y'all don't quench their spirits because they have sweet sweet spirits um, and so um, I think that is so important even with our faith whenever y'all are curious about scripture don't um, don't allow that to um, to discourage you and question your faith it's a good thing to question it and to go back and read scripture and everything um, i just realized in verse nine i forgot to talk about this um verse nine for many reasons this woman would have been despised by many of the religious leaders in that day of jesus she was a woman a samaritan and a woman of questionable reputation yet in the interview with nicodemus jesus or john showed us jesus has something to say to religious establishment remember we talked about nicodemus last last time in the meeting with the Samaritan woman at the well, John showed us Jesus has something to say to those despised by the religious establishment. Um, and so, uh, okay, verse nine. Um, the authors decide the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Explain to the diaspora readership that rabbis considered Samaritans to be in a continual state of uncleanliness. Unclean um, uncleanness. So there again, that's that dirtiness. And y'all, this reminded me. I went to Romania on a mission trip a few but years back, um, and that's actually how Romania views. Well, they did at the time. I don't know if they've changed. And if anybody's from Romania, if you know this to not be true, please let me know. Um, but um, where we were at, we stayed in an orphanage. And this orphanage, um, the, if the kids would go down to the village, the village would consider the orphans dirty because they were orphans. I don't know if they didn't read John 1, 29. I don't know, um, but they considered them. And so they, they wouldn't get near them. Um, even people would not go to them. And so I, that saddens me that because we're supposed to take care of the orphans and the widows. Um, but this is still going on nowadays. Um, this still happens nowadays. And so this is just really sad that, um, that, it's really sad that people have to look at people like that and think that it wasn't the kids fault that their parents put them up for adoption and put them in an orphanage. I don't understand that. Um, but that is the case. And so it, whenever I read verse nine, I just thought that is just so sad. That is exactly, I mean that, but I don't know. And in other countries, maybe that way. Um, that was the only one I went to an orphanage to I know crystal. It, it broke my heart because these or these kids were amazing. They were amazing. So, um, yeah. Okay, so verses 10 and 12, the old, in the Old Testament, living water is sometimes associated with Jehovah. He is called the fountain of living waters, and you can go to Jeremiah 2, 13 and 17, 13. Um, and so, or did I read 10? I did read 10 and 12. Okay, and then verse 12, um, the women's account of Jacob giving the Samaritans the well and drinking from it, from it himself was based on the tradition, not scripture. The book of Genesis does not record Jacob digging a well, drinking from it, and giving it to his sons. So um, there's that tradition thing. 
Okay, so we talked about this in John 1 again. You can go back and rewatch that um, if, you if you didn't see that. But adding to scripture and adding to rituals is not godly. That is not what God wants us to do. Um, and so that's what they were doing. Again, they're putting religion over relationship. Oh, if we could just grasp that, <laughs> how many of us does that hurt? <laughs> I am so guilty of this. I do this too. So I can't look at them and think, oh, they're just awful because I mean, I totally, there are some things that I think, oh, this is the way it is. But if I go back in scripture, I have to back up everything with scripture. That's what I always say, especially whenever I counsel, because I counsel, I'm always like, if I tell you anything that I can't back up with scripture, I shouldn't be saying it. Um, and that's just the way it is. And so if there's a lot of traditions that the Pharisees and the Sadducees did that were not biblical, and they, and I mean, it's still like that to today. Um you know, and so um, we just have to really be cautious about tradition, y'all. Be very cautious about that um, because you need to look back and see what scripture says and see if you can back up what you think, what you're doing, what you think and everything. Um, I hope that makes sense. Let me know if that makes sense, y'all. Um, so verses 13 through 14. Um, Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up with him, within him from eternal life. Um, so that is awesome. So our Lord promises an endless supply of satisfying water forever and really gets specific. We're talking about eternal life. This is the fountain of youth. This is the fountain of eternal life. Now, his point is unmistakable. This is permanent, consistent, full, satisfying, everlasting mercy and blessing from God to the sinner who asks. The analogy has now moved to its point. The doctrine is the doctrine of eternal life. He's offering her eternal life, which is a spiritual reality, the gift of mercy, the gift of grace for all who ask. Um, it's living water. It's satisfaction forever, soul satisfaction. So he's saying, you don't need those relationships that aren't godly. You don't need them. You're living in a, in, he taught, he goes into this and he's saying, no, I am everything you need. You don't need to find fulfillment in other things. And y'all who, uh, how many of us do that? We want to find fulfillment. And I know I've talked about this before. We want to find fulfillment in stuff. We want to find fulfillment in people. We want to find fulfillment and our kids and um, just our house, our cars, our bank account, our, you know, fill in the blank. We have enough of those things that we can fill in that we want to find fulfillment. But Jesus here is saying you don't need anything but him. And y'all, this is so good for those of us who like we can look at things and kind of covet them and wish we were, you know, like so and so or wish we had a life like that or wish we had a husband like that or wish we had kids like that. and everything but ultimately we have Jesus and he's all we need he is all we need um and so in this he's saying I have the gift of mercy which we need I have the gift of grace which we for surely need um and so he in him we have that satisfaction of living water um and so this is what this is so crazy to me because in verse 15 she says sir she said the woman says to him give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. She is so skeptic, y'all. Um, the response of the Samaritan woman was logical, yet not spiritual. Do you see there are so many people that mistake in this? We, we can have the right answer, but without Jesus, it means nothing. We can have a good life and we can live a good life, but without Jesus, it means nothing. Um, it just means nothing. We have to have a relationship with him. Um, she wanted to avoid the work of coming to the well every day. It was as if she responded, Jesus, if you want to make my life easier and more convenient, then I'm all for it. Give it to me. Maybe because she has been outcasted and hurt, which I can totally get. How many, uh, I mean, how many of us know someone there, like where they're just so skeptic? Um, they're so skeptic of Jesus and their relationship um, with like how many? I mean, I know people like that, that just, you know, they will be the first to tell you the Bible is not real. They'll be the first to tell you, like, and so they're so skeptic. So anything you say, they're going to be like, mm, no, no, no. But the thing is, is we're called to live that life of godliness so much so that they do question why we live like that and everything. Um, so here she's saying, so, sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty. 
or come all the way here to draw. Um, she just doesn't get it. Um, you know, and all I can see in her is like, is this, this man, what is he talking about? Um, I think she gets some of it. I do think she's getting it. And she is starting, I think she's starting to think in spiritual. I think this is the conversion. So this is, this is her, this is the spirit versus the flesh to me. This is exactly what I feel like is going. I do not know her. <laughs> she was a long time ago. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking it's her spirit versus the flesh. It is, I know what he's saying sounds great, but it sounds too good to be true. How many think that? How many think that? Like grace sounds too good to be true. Jesus sounds too good to be true. I'm going to have to have that skeptic. And then those are battling. That's the spirit and the flesh. We have it every day, y'all. Every day we spat, that is our battle. We, we can choose to sin. We can choose not to. We can choose to let the Holy Spirit guide us. We can choose to let our spirit guide us. That's Romans 7, y'all. Romans 7. Go back and read it. Um, so this is just, it's just going back and forth. So um, the spirit of God, the main thing you need to see, though, of this is the spirit of God is working in her heart through the words of our Savior. That is the most important thing. How much time do I got? I have 10, I have nine minutes. I'm going to hurry up and try to get through this because this is so good. I wanted to stop at 15, but I was hoping I get, I would get to um, 18. So I'm glad I do. Um, so verses 16 through 18, Jesus says, go call your husband. He told her and come back here. Um, I don't have a husband. She answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, for you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So this was not a strange request. It extended in this extended public conversation with the woman, Jesus was straining the boundaries of cultural propriety. The conversation would be more cultural appropriate if the woman's husband were present. Um, so, oh, okay, Jennifer, I'm so glad you got to join us a little bit on your lunch break. Um, so here you see Christ has different doors for entering into different people's souls. And to some, he enters by the understanding, and to many, by the affections. To some, he comes by the way of fear, to another, by the way of hope. And to this woman, he came by the way of conscience. Okay, so, y'all, this is so important. Everybody comes to know the Lord in different ways. There's not one wrong way or right way. It's just, we just, the ultimate thing is if we come to him. <laughs> That's the ultimate thing. But this is saying he comes to every, all, there is, you cannot down somebody by saying they came to know the Lord through this way. I just don't think that that's right because as long as they have a relationship with Jesus, that's all that matters. Um, and so that he's, he knows how to get to us. It's just, we have to let him choose to get to us that way. Um, and he says in here, he says, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. Jesus brought, brought this, uh, this embarrassing issue up because of her sinful life had to be confronted. This is huge, y'all. This is huge. This woman had to decide what she loved more, her sin or the Messiah. How convicting is that? How convicting is that? Um, yes, Crystal, Jesus totally meets us where we are at and what we need. That is where he meets us. Um, that is so true, Crystal. And so here Jesus is saying, what do you want more? Do you want your life of sin more or do you want me more? Because I am so much better than that life of sin. And this is what saddens me for people who settle for like, um, like if you are dating, um, don't settle for a relationship that is not godly. Um, and I tell this to my, my 20 year old all the time. If you are in a relationship, if you're married to an unbeliever, then you need to stay and you need to show them grace and you need to show them the love of Christ. Um, but if you're dating and that relationship is not honoring to the Lord, you need to flee from it. You just need to turn from it and repent and go towards him. Because I can promise you, Jesus is going to give you so much more than any relationship ever. Um, and because he, he's so beautiful and perfect. That's what Jesus is saying here. He addressed this and he's saying, and I thought this was so cool when I read this because it's just so countercultural to our culture right now. Um, and so verse 18, the woman had five husbands. Um, and the, the Greek A-N-E-R can mean husband or man having engaged in a serious or illicit relationship. And she was not married to her current lover. Um, sexual relationships outside of marriage are forbidden in both Testament in both New Testament and Old Testament. Um, so when Jesus said that the man she lived with was not your husband, Jesus showed that living together and marriage are not the same thing. Jesus also showed that just because someone calls a relationship marriage, it does not mean that Jesus considers it marriage. 
don't you hate when you like I, in this? I don't you hate when you get caught caught in sin? I mean, seriously, does that not suck? I <laughs> just sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Does that not stink? Um, I hate that. And so that's what Jesus is doing. He's catching her on her sin. It's humiliating. But Jesus didn't he want to humiliate her. And I don't want anybody to think that Jesus was humiliating her. Jesus was loving her. He was loving her so much so that he wants what's best for her. And that's what he's saying here. He is not, he in no way is saying, you are an awful person. Look at you. You know, did he say that? He didn't say that. He's like, look, I'm telling you the truth. He only spoke truth to her. He only spoke truth to her. He told her it, where she was at in her relationship. That's all he did. He did not, he, he spoke truth. Um, but she was probably embarrassed. I would be too. I'm embarrassed a lot of my past. I'll be honest, y'all. I have a really bad shady past. Before I became a Christian, it was bad. Um, and if Jesus and Jesus did come to me, and He did have to convict me of my sin, and it was beautiful because in that I got to see Jesus, and I got to know Him in a way I can't explain. Because whenever you see that humility, you see the need of a Savior, and that's what I see whenever we get convicted. Even now, I mean, I'm still I still sin. We all still sin. We cannot say we are perfect because we're a liar if we do. Because we are, we're just sinners. But the thing is, we're in need of grace, and that's where we constantly come to the Savior. Now, should we sin because we, you know, go to Romans 6. It says, should you keep on sinning by no means, don't stay in that sin. We should never want to stay in a sin. We should always want to turn from it. But we get the beauty of the Lord whenever we do, and we get his grace whenever we do. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Jesus in no way is humiliating this, this, um, this precious sweet lady. And I am so excited because we get to see what she does with all this. And that's why we know next week, whenever we go through this, this is how we know that she was not humiliated. She was loved and she knows that. And we're going to see that next week, how loved she was um, and how important this woman was and is in our, like, in our walk with the Lord. This lady is huge in our walk with the Lord. She is. She is a huge, um, God used her mightily. So um, how exciting is that, y'all? Is this not exciting? I, I love it. I love God's word. I love how it all comes together and intertwines. Old Testament, New comes together and how good he is. So um, just a recap, um, since some of y'all weren't on in the beginning, we're going to meet next week. I will give you more of a heads up um, on the time next week. I'm so sorry I gave last minute. I really honestly didn't know if I was going to have time to do the lesson this week. I was grateful that God allowed the time to open up so I could do it. Um, so next week I will definitely have time to do it, but then in July, I'm going to take July off, um, to spend with my little one. Um, and then we'll come right back whenever school starts up, but we'll finish up on time. So next week we will meet. Um, and, um, I am really excited y'all. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, I am humbled at the thought that y'all even listen to me. I don't, I, and I am just really excited about God's word and how he meets us where we're at. So if you know somebody who's going to use this, just make sure you share this with them. Um, and if y'all have questions, just feel free to PM me. Um, I do not mind at all. And, um, if y'all need anything, just let me know. Um, and I thank y'all so much. I love this precious group. I really do. I love y'all. And I'm so thankful for y'all. Um, have a wonderful and fabulous week y'all. Talk to you later. Bye.